Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you've all got a cup of tea and are ready to join us for this Event Scotland webinar. Um, before we start, just some housekeeping rules. You'll find yourselves uh, already on mute and with, already without your videos. I can't see any of you, which is very strange. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see a small grey box that will allow you to ask us questions. If you have any questions or if you have any problems with the system, then just drop your note in there and we'll be able to help you. We've got two speakers for you this morning. We're going to have two short presentations. I'll ask them some questions, we'll get a bit of conversation going, and then we'll open the floor to all of your questions. So get thinking as we go along. And both presenters are very happy and willing to share their presentations after this morning's event. So don't worry about having to write anything down. So on we go. So my name's Lindsay. I am the Deputy Chief Exec of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society, and I'm your host this morning. Um, I feel like I'm, we all know some of you that are watching us today. So to all of our friends in the event sector, hello, and I hope you're well, and that we're all finding pathways through this. Um, so joining me today, I have Johnny Cole Hamilton, who's the Exec Director of the Championship at the RNA, who are the governing body for golf worldwide, as well as organizing major international golfing championships and competitions. I also have Dominic McKay, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Scottish Rugby, which is the governing body for Rugby Union in Scotland. So both are joining us today to share their insights and their learnings and their best practice from pilot events that they've been running in their organisation, both with and without spectators and including international competition. And they're going to answer some of your questions and give you some of their insight about how we can put on live events in a safe and accessible way during this pandemic. Um, both Dom and Johnny are members of the Events Scotland Industry Advisory Group, who are um, who have set up this webinar for us today and have a range of information and tools on their website if you want to check it out. And the Events Scotland Industry Advisory Group has 17 members, which is across the industry. We're largely talking about sport today, but actually that event advisory group includes professional sport, culture, music, business events, venues, local authorities and that wider supply chain that's so critical to the successful delivery of our events. So um, we've got about 20 minutes worth of presentation and we're going to start with Johnny Cole Hamilton who will be joining us shortly. Now this is where I need my filler music and potentially a, uh, a small performance. Johnny over to you. Thank you Lindsay and uh... Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really kind of you to uh, ask me to come along and share some experiences that um, we had with uh, putting on the AIG Women's Open. Uh, no, that's it. So, yeah, sorry, a few technical issues. I, I think it was really important for me just to quickly set out, I don't want to make the assumption that everybody understands what the AIG Women's Open is. Um, and so I, just to give it a bit of context, I just wanted to make sure that that was understood. So it, it, it's a major golf championship for women professional golfers and amateur golfers. It took place at Royal Troon Golf Club in August, which is uh, one of our open championship venues. Um, it had three practice rounds and four championship rounds. Uh, 144 players took part. Uh, we had an international field of players from 33 different countries. It was broadcast uh, internationally um, across the globe. And uh, we had, well, normally we would have around 100 international media outlets on the site. I think the key things for us and the key challenges from the very first were it's a week long championship. So we, as I say, we have three practice days and four championship rounds. So unlike a lot of sports, we had to make sure we kept everybody safe for a full week. And we also had the international element of getting players from all four corners of the globe over to Royal Troon. For us, it was really important to set out what our success looked like before we embarked on taking this forward. And one of the very first things was strategically it's hugely important for the RNA that uh, women's sport, women's golf in particular from our perspective uh, is taken forward and goes in a very positive direction. So we saw this as this event being hosted as having a really positive impact for women's golf and women's sports more generally. Uh, women's golf, as the pandemic started, their playing opportunities were severely curtailed across the world because of the pandemic. And, we wanted to provide 
not just a playing opportunity, but a major championship playing opportunity. Uh, we obviously wanted to support the cultural reopening of sport in Scotland at the time. Uh, it was really important to us as well that we promoted significant physical and mental health benefits of this game of golf and sport in general. And I think most importantly, we wanted to, working with other, collaborating with other events like DOM and other uh, event organisers, we wanted to demonstrate that with careful planning and risk mitigation, it is possible to bring events back safely. And whilst understanding not all of you have had that opportunity, but we certainly wanted to be a trailblazer and try and show a way to do it safely and with the right mitigation. When, when we, we laid out the success, what it looked like, it was obviously very key that we had critical success factors. Um, now, the first one that we had was that all participants must be accredited and identifiable. So we worked with RF Identikit, an accreditation system and used photo ID. You know, it was our discussions with government. We had to keep the numbers down to 500 people on the site. So we had to know exactly who was on site, who they were, and where they were. Um, and we needed to make sure that anyone on site could be accountable for their actions. So that was a really key cornerstone of a success factor. We also had to make sure that the players were strictly limited in where they could and could not go. That meant the creation of some biosecure zones. We had to take hotels on an exclusive basis. And players were made acutely aware that the biosecure zone was the venue, the course, uh, and their hotels, and they could not stray between the two. Uh, we had, so that was another one. The third one was access to all elements of the biosecure zone would be strictly controlled. So we had extremely rigid protocols on the biosecure zone to make sure it was that no stage compromised. Uh, all parties had to stick to that or there were consequences. Um, any player who had, who would have broken the rules or the protocols, we would have disqualified from the championship immediately. And they were fully aware of that from the start. Uh, and we had to make sure that we removed the temptation of rules being broken by having systems in place to make sure the players and the caddies were well looked after. Another very important success factor for us was that comprehensive guidance was produced and reviewed by government. Um, that, if I was giving any initial advice, that is the most critical thing to do, make sure that you bring the local agencies, the local authorities, the public health bodies, uh, devolved government, UK government, along on the journey the whole time. And we worked very much with uh, our chief medical officer and health and safety officer and all the other tours and with government to make sure that the protocols were agreed and the risk assessments had input from everybody. You've then got to make sure that you clearly communicate all of these protocols uh, clearly to all parties to make sure they are aware of their obligations and that makes you know that means all the different tours representing all the different competitors and you know make sure that everybody is well informed of what you're trying to do and we, we feel we did that and lastly it's very important clearly that you have a plan in place should the pandemic escalate once you started the planning or indeed once you're underway so we had an incident response plan which we agreed with the local authority and the SAG process to make sure everybody was clear what we did had an outbreak occurred. Um, just a quick point on some of the protocols we implemented. So we held the championship behind closed doors, so we did not have uh, any spectators because that was not permissible at the time. Um, we obviously had to work with the UK government uh, in terms of getting exemptions for international elite sports. Uh, individuals and support staff to make sure that they could access the UK without quarantining. That was really important. The UK government were extremely supportive on that. Uh, obviously, regular contact with um, the UK and Scottish governments was really, really important. Uh, the bio zones were uh, an essential part of what we did. Medical planning, uh, we took the early decision to have private staff to make sure we didn't add to the burden of the NHS, which worked really successfully for us. Uh, as I say, the SAG process was absolutely critical in all of this. Um, also the link with the Public Health Authority Environmental Health, I can't stress that enough. We actually ran a tabletop exercise, which was 
key to stress test, lots of specific scenarios which work really well and provided a good educational element. And I would say that the education and uh, the key, uh, educating all the key parties and understanding the reasons for the protocols was extremely important to get compliance. Uh, the testing protocols were extremely important as well, obviously. We had a lot of collaboration with all the major tours, the LPGA, the LAT. We learned a lot from the Lady Scottish Open, which took, the week, took part the week before. Uh, and we made sure we had effective communication and alignment with all those bodies. Uh, antigen testing prior to travel and prior to entering the biosecure zone was absolutely key to us mitigating our risk and uh, was absolutely essential. Uh, we obviously had limited options avail available for testing privately, but we did get an agreement with a company called Signpost, who provided the best uh, option at the time. Um, the turnaround for the time of test was around six hours, which uh, was much quicker than the industry standard at the time. And we were also very fortunate to have something called the Luton van, which meant we could test on site and turn those around and those results around in about three hours. And you can see the statistics from those tests. Um, having an ability to integrate the health cred system with the accreditation system was critical for us. If, you know, if an individual failed any of the checks, their accreditation was automatically suspended and they wouldn't be able to enter the site. That was a key thing for us. Um, temperature checks were extremely important. And the medical support behind this uh, to assess whether the high temperature was in fact COVID or not uh, was critical as well. Uh, we had to make sure we had a lot of messaging around social distancing and making sure that we had protocols in place. To, if we had one positive case, that it wouldn't take out the entire field. And uh, we had a de dedicated COVID-19 officer checking that we were following all the measures that we said we would put in place. Um, we did have some innovation at the time. Uh, we, the RIF Identikit system, which I've talked about, was extremely helpful and is probably something we'll roll out at the Open on all of our championships. We had a virtual media centre. Um, that was uh, extremely important as well. Um, we also had a health cred video, a health and safety video, which was mandatory for all constituents to, to watch. Um, we had daily symptom checks, which were mandatory for all antigen testing. Access to the site was only permitted if uh, all the above elements had been completed. Uh, the virtual media centre, as I say, uh, that allowed us to have the worldwide media accredited and report on the championship remotely. We had something like three and a half thousand online articles and 299 printed articles introduced specifically. Uh, for, we introduced this option specifically for the AIGWO because of COVID, and it's something that we might plan to keep going and uh, build on. So we've we've had a learning from there. In terms of the phase build approach, we had a much smaller build than our business as usual. But you know we kept the same time frame on the build in order to minimise the number of contractors on site at any one time. This worked really well, but would not be feasible in a business as usual environment. In terms of our championship office layout, we all had temporary pods which kept us all separate, and uh, but it allowed us to work as a team as well. I think the main thing for me is the key learnings. So. The importance of collaboration, the shared learnings between the tour, the LPGA, and all our other event industry colleagues, uh, strong relationships with government, public health, and multi agency organizations is absolutely critical to make sure you have alignment and the ability to act quickly in an emergency. Uh, consistency across our events, you know, players playing in the LPGA and then the Scottish Open needed to have the same experience, so we collaborated very strongly with them. Education and engagement with all parties was critical as well. You know, clearly communicating with the players and the caddies in the advance led to better compliance. Our ability to manage expectations ahead of time um, really helped uh, those who were attending the championship knowing that the protocols were there and that they needed to be adhered to. Um, we got lots of positive feedback from players around the world and how safe they felt, which was really important. 
and they felt they were well looked after. That was a critical success factor for us. We wanted to clearly communicate with staff and communicate with contractors to ensure that everybody understood what the protocols were and that they were being monitored and why they were in place. Engagement with the local community was extremely important to us. Royal Troon members, the local residents, we had a nursing home within 100 yards of the venue, which was obviously critically important that they understood and felt safe with what we were doing. That was really important. And, you know, it really was a team effort to politely enforce social distancing measures. You know, it was hugely successful. It had a big positive impact. It's helped us enormously with our strategic aims around women's golf and women's place in sport but it was extremely expensive and uh, it's not financially viable in the long term. I mean, we understand that we were in the position to be able to do this, but uh, you know, it was a considerable expense and not viable going forward. And the last thing I would say is, if any of you are planning to run an event and you have a title sponsor, AIG, our title sponsor, I have to say were incredible from the word go. They were completely aligned with what we were trying to do they understood that their rights would be severely affected but they were extremely supportive throughout and it wouldn't have been possible to do what we did without them but i hope that gives a very quick run through 10 minutes is pretty difficult to uh, take you through everything but i hope that was an insightful uh, insight into uh, how we put on the aig's women's open behind closed doors and I, i'll be very happy to take any questions uh, when lindsay puts those forward thank you Thank you so much, Johnny, and yeah, really very insightful. Um, while we swap Johnny out and we'll bring Dom in, um, there's a lot to think about in there. Um, and for those of you that join later, we will be sharing these slides so you can steal all of Johnny's top tips, um, which I thought was enormously helpful. Um, and I think we're probably going to see some similar themes come through in Dom's presentation. So, Johnny, do you want to stop sharing? And, oh, that's Dom, here we are. So Dom, are you good to go? Johnny, you can hide away for 10 minutes while Dom does his bit. Um, you'd think I would have learned some jokes from all my time in Fringeland, but sadly not, nobody wants to hear them. Dom, are you good to go? Good morning, everybody. Hopefully, good hopefully morning, leave you to it. Hopefully you can hear me and you can see me. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks to Johnny for giving us a, a brilliant intro there in terms of what's happening in the world of golf. I'm going to change gears a little bit now and, and talk about rugby. I need to graduate a little bit from those behind closed doors events that Johnny was describing there to talk about um, our pilot event with a crowd. Um, and maybe to start with, I give a little bit of background in, in who Scottish rugby is, what we do, just to give a bit of context. Um, we're the national governing body for, for rugby in Scotland. We're responsible for managing and maintaining the National Stadium, Murrayfield, um, and supporting the grassroots in, in Scotland. But we also own and operate uh, two professional clubs, Glasgow Warriors and, and Edinburgh Rugby. Um, we have three main income streams. Um, one is television revenue, uh, one is sponsorship, and th the third, crucially, is spectators and um, buying tickets for our events. We will put on around 90 to 100 events every year in our various venues um, in Glasgow and Edinburgh and around Scotland. Uh, but the lifeblood of our sport is spectators coming through the turnstiles. So it's been um, similar to many people on this call, a, a, an extremely challenging period over the last seven to eight months, and will continue to be so with the lack of spectators coming to, to major and, and small events. Um, so we really pushed hard with the government to try to get them to be comfortable with the idea of, of a pilot event and a pilot event programme. And I'm going to take you through a series of slides, and I'm going to do it relatively quickly to keep to my time limit. Um, but we'll share the slides around after the session just to make sure that the detail that I cover off somewhat quickly, you've got access to if that's of, of, of any interest. So I guess that the th first thing for us is why, why a pilot event? Why would we want to do a pilot event? One, we wanted to demonstrate and provide a solution to the Scottish Government about restarting the events industry in, in general. And that was really important to us that we were, you know, by dint of the size and the scale of, of our organisation, we were able to use ourselves as a backdrop to pilot and to test some activities. We wanted to demonstrate that live events themselves can operate securely in a COVID environment with spectators, um, with players, uh, with officials. Um, we wanted to restore confidence in the public and in the support uh, supporters and, and the broader public that the event industry is ready to play its part in restarting the whole uh, the whole sector. Uh, but we needed government to, to work with us on that. 
So confidence was, was a huge thing for us. And we wanted to raise the, the mood of the nation. It's been a very difficult number of months. So by having spectators coming back to sport, we felt was a really important thing to do. Um, and we wanted to do that with you know, collaboration with the government, with the event industry itself, and make sure that any learnings that we had were shared and cascaded across the whole event sector. So really important for us to be continue to sort of collaborate uh, as we go. Um, so I guess that the next sort of point here is how did we go about it? Well, we wanted to make sure we convinced the government that we had a good plan, a very robust plan. So we worked with the government, Public Health Scotland, the local uh, safety teams. We brought in experience from Scottish football and Celtic Football Club and ourselves worked very closely on that pilot event plan at the very beginning. Um, we wanted to make sure we, we brought in experience from the uh, Scottish Events Campus um, and the broader experience from across industry. So we put together a really robust and detailed plan um, to be the first pilot event actually to take place in, in a major stadium in the UK. Um, and we were pleased that we were able to sort of convince colleagues to do that. And part of that was about being transparent in our risk assessments and being uh, robust in our reviews. And we wanted to make sure it was a phased and timed approach. So we picked the right event at the right time relative to the pandemic to try and uh, progress uh, the, the pilot event. Um, mitigation was critical. So what were we going to do to, to demonstrate that a pilot event could be successfully managed? We are fortunate that we have a, a large site here at Murrayfield. We've got 26 acres um, with an open stadium, largest stadium in Scotland. It's all open air. You can walk from the, the tram outside to your seat and stay outside the whole way through. So we're, we're fortunate that we've got an unusually helpful site to begin to test some of those pilot event fees. But clearly we needed to reduce our, our capacity. We needed to reduce the number of entry points that we had. We needed to think about our ticketing policies and target those to particular household groups and particular areas. We needed to maximise the points of, of entry in respect of staggered arrival times to limit queues and to maintain social distancing. We needed to trial some new concepts around contactless entry. So we needed to invest a little bit in our ticketing activities. And we didn't want to have any bags into the venue as we would normally do to protect our security. So hand sanitization, as we would normally do for an event, was really outweighted um, from turnstiles all the way through to the, to the seating deck. We wanted to maximize the number of toilets and the management and the queuing system around our toilet provision. We wanted to consider the time that you would spend in the stadium to reduce those pinch points so that whilst we would normally at uh, an event at Murrayfield welcome people in for a couple of hours before the game, have a beer, catch up their friends, um, watch a game of rugby before they come into the main stadium itself. We wanted to reduce that, keep it really simple, bring people in in a safe and sensible manner, man manner get them to their seats in a graduated way and then graduated, get them uh, uh, leaving the stadium in a very safe and sensible way. Contactless bars we considered, contactless catering solutions we developed and, and they worked really successfully. We wanted to minimise the public transport uh, for this particular pilot event to ensure that you could re uh, reduce any contact points. So we brought people in the main to the stadium by car or by walking. Um, and that was a, a really successful um, public messaging campaign that we had at the beginning of the, of the week to encourage people to make sure they came by, by foot if that was at all possible. We wanted to limit the number of staff. Just to give you a bit of an insight, on a, on a match day here at, at Murrayfield, we'll have 67,000 people in, in their seats and we'll have around 3,500 people managing the site, supporting the facility and making the, the magic happen. So we really needed to tighten that down quite significantly. We wanted to have very limited um, hospitality, but we wanted to have some small hospitality to prove the concept to, to graduate thereafter. And importantly, we wanted to make sure we, we made our supporters feel safe in, exa in, in advance. And we, we did quite a lot of public messaging, which we'll come on to in a second as well. And of course, we wanted to promote and work with the government to promote uh, facts in terms of the, the promotion of the public health messaging. Um, and you know, throughout the whole journey, developing the pilot plan, uh, delivering the pilot plan and reviewing the pilot plan, we did that in partnership, as I mentioned. Just to give a little bit of practical examples of, of some of the things we needed to consider and deliver against, we needed to scope our environment into three different areas um, in terms of accreditation. Because we had those spectators coming in, we have around uh, 300 people who, who manage the, the event from a player's point of view, from an official's perspective, from an accreditation perspective. And then we had that broader area 
of Amber, people that needed to be involved in the event that didn't need to be near our players. And then the third element is our green zone, where we would have access for those uh, those per those people that are coming in to, to, to enjoy the game itself. And each, an element, each element of our accreditation system needed to be robust, tested, linked to, to track and trace, of course, but everyone that was coming into the ground needed to make sure that they were um, wearing face coverings as well. So some of the public messing in advance of that was really, really helpful and really critical to allowing government to, to sign off this particular event. But to run an event of our size is quite complicated. It's all done under the glare of live television. So we've got live TV and because we were the first pilot event to take place in the UK, it created a lot of interest in advance, which was helpful in terms of addressing one of those missions, which was to create confidence. So our ticketing strategy, um, again, I won't go through every line here, but just to give that sort of indication, we had contactless um, uh, tickets. So we were sending out our tickets out by e-tickets in advance, sold in groups, so family groups, household groups, and then we were making sure that they were communicated to individually in advance about staggered um, arrival times. We were making sure that they uh, filled in a form in advance to demonstrate that they were uh, safe and secure, they had no symptoms, they had no issues in respect to COVID, and we insisted that they all wear uh, face coverings. So they knew in advance the details that we were expecting them to adhere to by the time that they arrived at, at the venue. And they were, of course, reinforced as they arrived at the venue as well. But the ticketing strategy was clearly crucial for that, that first event to be successful. We targeted the Edinburgh area, and the game was Edinburgh against Glasgow. So our two professional clubs, which would normally attract around 30,000 people. But for the, for the pilot event, we agreed at around 1,000 people in total coming into the building. So around 750 supporters or so, 200 to 300, 300 people uh, there to support the event. So massively reduced capacity, but actually it was a more complicated event to put on than a Scotland-England game with that larger crowd because of the, the restrictions that we put in place. The ticketing model that we used for the pilot event was uh, two meter social distancing. Since then, the SGSA have come up with the updated ticketing models that we are, are keen to work towards for our graduated events that come down to that one meter plus uh, social distancing environment. Two meters in a 67,000 stadium is, is very weird because it's very small numbers, but we were really just using it as a, as a proof of concept. So as I mentioned earlier on, we based it on two meters um, and we, you know, we layered that up with all the appropriate um, information that you can imagine uh, to make sure it is the most appropriate managed uh, event that you could possibly put on. Um, it was quite telling um, once people came into the building how slightly soulless it was. It was marginally less soulless than having no spectators, but having 750 spectators in a 67,000 seater venue is, is a very light touch. But everyone complied with, with the requirement to wear face masks. Everyone complied with the staggered arrival times. And again, that was a really important thing for us to demonstrate that if you put the right messaging in place, people will be happy to comply with that. But to take uh, no chances, we made sure that the seats that were available were unable to be used. So we were selling effectively in pairs. Every other seat within a two meter, two meter radius around those two seats that were usable were made unusable with, with, uh, with cable ties. And we had ushers and stewards there to direct people to make sure they were sitting in the seats that were allocated to them and they couldn't migrate, they couldn't move around, they couldn't interact with the other um, patrons that were in, in the building. So the customer journey, really important. So we worked really closely with Transport Scotland, with Scott Rail, with Network Rail and the government to make sure that the, the flow into the building was really uh, successful. Notwithstanding, we were trying to encourage people to, uh, to walk. Um, we introduced a, a travel radius for our ticket purchasers. So you could only come to the game if you were living within a five mile radius. Uh, and we supported uh, the messaging in advance of that, as, as mentioned there. And that was all about demonstrating confidence that the public transport system could work and could cope with events restarting. Their feedback to us, as, on, as you would expect from the transport for providers was, you know, give us a larger crowd. You know, testing a crowd with 600 people is, is very easy for them to do. So they're keen for us to work with the government, work with them to get to larger crowds in due course to test their infrastructure. We made sure that as people arrived at the stadium, um, there was no queuing. They were arriving and spreading out at the times that they, they, they committed to. We had uh, protected environments in our ticket kiosks. We made sure that our turnstile operators were uh, fully re uh, and robustly communicated to in advance. That they knew what their role was to play uh, as supporters arrived. 
and all sanitize all supporters that came through were given hand sanitization the moment they went through that that uh, that environment so we're trying to really go over the top in terms of reinforcing our message around safety before safety during and safely heading home after we went down to the uh, the point of you know we wanted to make sure we could test some ex examples of cashless bars and cashless and um, catering facilities they work really well but again some learnings for us there um, in terms of uh, making sure everyone adheres to the, the queuing system so we had sort of dots on the ground to make sure that it was uh, being adhered to um, but again uh, making sure that people were behaving in a way that we wanted them to behave which is very different from the way that they would normally behave when they came to the, the stadium as usual so it's about behavioral change as well as uh, public messaging engaging our supporters in advance as johnny mentioned and um, even from those that were coming into golf lots of communication in advance to players and to officials we were going that one stage further players officials but now spectators and making sure they understood really clearly before they arrived what was expected of them and as i said earlier on everyone really behaved brilliantly when they came into the ground and took their the responsibility that was given to them pretty seriously because they were the first event starting in the uk of a major size um, i think there was a lot of pride in people making sure they behaved appropriately and managed it effectively in the ground we engaged with them as well to make sure that over the public address system over our big screens over our led screens we were reminding people both in the ground but also to those millions of people that were watching it live on television around the world that we were as an organization and as a country doing our bit to make sure we keep reinforcing messages in the ground but also to those that were watching and um, so they felt really safe and that we were projecting the right message around uh, around their sport but it was a weird and slightly unusual environment so this gives you an idea of how 750 people look in a socially distanced stadium it is very unusual very different but it was a proof of contract concept for us and that was important for us to get right we had with us um on the evening um representatives from the government so we had professor jason leach the head of uh, the scottish government's public health um area national clinical director we had a various a number of government officials who are watching it themselves firsthand to see how the event went and they were uh, really pleased with the the build-up to the event really pleased with the delivery of the event really pleased with the public messaging around that event um, which gave them a lot of confidence as we did our review and as johnny mentioned one of the critical elements of the activity is to do that review what worked what didn't work and we locked into that a, a two to three week post event review period to make sure there was no spike no clinical reason why there would be an issue around the event taking place and i'm pleased to say that the event passed uh, with flying colors in terms of the review by the council by the government the feedback from our supporters and partners were was really positive which we're, we're pleased about and um, there was no localized increase in cases it was efficiently and effectively managed on site which was you know really pleasing but more most importantly i think the feedback that we had from government was that they were they were uh, really pleased with how the event went and the messaging associated with that to the extent that they were encouraging us and remain very encouraging of us to work towards graduated crowds and, and larger crowds in, in due course so we have developed a, a further plan for 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, which is ready to go as soon as we get that support from, from the government and the green light to go with the government. We put on, you know, every weekend uh, behind closed doors events. Um, uh, last weekend, we had Scotland women playing, we had Scotland men playing, we had Glasgow playing, Edinburgh playing. So we're putting events on constantly. But until we get those larger crowds back in and crowds of a reasonable size, then it's always going to be a very challenging environment for, for us to operate in. But from a pilot event perspective, we're pleased with how it went, really pleased with the, the feedback. And I guess our sharing of best practice, hopefully today and through the events industry in general, will give confidence to government, give confidence to the event industry that we can restart quickly. We've got the smart people across our industry that are ready and that are willing to, to restart the sector and to get us back moving. And we can do that in a way which creates confidence across the sort of public. So, um, hopefully that presentation, that sort of whistle-stop tour of getting a thousand people into the building, back into events, is, is helpful. And we want to help you and, and support the, the, the whole industry begin to restart. We are ready to do that from a Scottish rugby point of view. And I know many of the colleagues in this call are, are ready to do that as well. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, happy to take any questions that Johnny mentioned earlier on, and I'll hand back to, to Lindsay. Thanks, Tom. Um, Johnny, do you want to come and join us? Oh, I can see lots of questions coming in now, which is great. Um, I think you've both answered this um, quite 
in in the course of your presentation but i've got quite a straightforward question which is it's a lot of work and a lot of money um and a lot of a lot of time and a lot of energy what what was it that compelled you to to run these pilot events when in many respects it might have been easier to just hibernate and wait it out and um, i guess there's a sort of why did you bother when it was such a huge amount of work dom i feel yeah, like you well, answered that but well look i'm very happy to sort of underline really why one it's um we take our responsibility really seriously in scotland and um, we by the dint of our size and shape we've got an opportunity and the responsibility to try to restart the event industry so that was that was in our mind of course we also happen to have the facilities. We've got the largest stadium in Scotland. It's entirely open plan, as I mentioned. So that's sort of unique. It lends itself to um, to events being restarted. But also we needed a pathway. We needed to say to government and work with government that there is a pathway within the events industry to restart it in an appropriate and graduated way. And it just so happened that Johnny and Golf and myself and rugby were the, at the vanguard of that. Um, but it, would have, it could have been anybody else, but it's vital for our industry to restart, to get crowds back in, because financially without crowds for us and for golf and for others, it's not a, it's not a palatable environment for us to operate in. No. Johnny? Yeah, I mean, very similar. Uh, as I think I said in my presentation, our, strategically it's really important for us individually to have an impact on the women's game. You know, out of every crisis, opportunities come, and we saw that as an opportunity to really have a positive impact on women's golf and women's sport. But like Dom said, we also saw it as a huge opportunity to show that with, if you do it properly, you plan for it properly, you can create momentum, you can create confidence in the government, both in the UK and the devolved Scottish government, that this is possible. And, uh, you know, Many people on this call will be desperate to do it, and we understand and appreciate that the opportunity might not have come their way yet, but hopefully Dom and I have shown that it is possible. And we're, I'm also very conscious on this call that Dom and I both represent elite sport, and I think our participation on the events industry advisory group has been really important because that group, as you said in the start, Leslie, is representative of the whole event industry. and if any of this work is helping the event industry then we are absolutely all for it yeah and i think um there's a question that's coming through from ben and ben stimson it's also on my list um and particularly mindful that we're going to get new tiers of um lockdowns coming through from scottish government on monday how um which might change your your local setup how has what you guys have, have undertaken on these big large scale events how can they how can our event planners that are here today apply this to their small, uh, their medium, their non-national events? Um, and how can they, they adapt what you've learned into their environments? Um, Johnny, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, I mean, for, I seem to have lost my screen for some, oh, here we go, back. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I think it's the ever adapting flexibility you have to have. I mean, the as I think I pointed out, the first thing you have to do is consider what does your success look like in terms of what are you trying to achieve, what are your objectives, and then you set out, as I hope I demonstrated, what your critical success factors are to achieve that success. And a huge amount of it will be engaging with public bodies, with government agencies, with your SAGs, and taking everyone on the journey from the very start and being able to have plans and response plans to be able to adapt to a changing situation. You know, we were teetering between having spectators, so we scenario planned that, we scenario planned behind closed doors, and we scenario planned a full AIG Women's Open. And in fact, before we cancelled the Open Championship, which was extremely depressing for everyone involved in the RNA. Uh, we scenario planned everything and only made the decision when no other options became available. Let me make a, a quick comment on, on the tearing uh, point, which is, you know, we, you know, we've tried, and Johnny's the same in uh, golf, um, to try to offer solutions to the government in terms of restarting the industry and pilot events. Well, just one small example of that, we're, in, we're a governing body, so we've got responsibility for over 200 clubs across Scotland. And in many respects, those 200 clubs, or rugby clubs across Scotland, are small event businesses. They're putting on games, they've got hospitality, they've got little events taking place in their buildings. So we provided guidance to all of our 200 clubs around how they might restart. 
under the, the previous sort of system, that national sort of system we were operating in. This new tiering system that is being uh, rubber stamped at the moment and will be you know, going live, I guess, for Monday, will provide an opportunity actually for us to reinforce some new guidance to our 200 clubs in terms of the events side of things, but also in terms of the rugby side of things. So I think there's opportunities actually within this new tiering structure for events to restart. So if I use an example, I could certainly foresee rugby clubs or football clubs um, beginning to restart with spectators in those tiers that are uh, zero to one, I think it is, or one to two. So it's entirely possible in a week or so's time that you might see a football game taking place in Ross County with a small socially distanced crowd. So it's, and I guess the challenge is for the whole events industry to look at that tiering structure, see how it may apply to their particular area, come up with a local solution, and as Johnny says, work really closely with the local authority, work really closely with the local yeah. SAG to, to provide a solution. We recently found that no one has the solutions um, and no one has the, the, the plan about how to deal with, with COVID. But if you can go to them with some ideas, some thoughts, you've got a great chance of your event beginning to get a chance to, to restart. And that's, that's I guess, one of my, my strong messages, which is be innovative and make sure you engage really early with the, with the local authority. And it's a question that's coming through from our um, participants today in a number of different ways. The one side of it is, was that were there specific experts and expertise that you went to to, to learn and and to understand um and the flip side of that is who is it that that rubber stamps and who gives you the the permission and the consent to to be able to do these things so um dom we, you can choose which one of those who who helps you and then and who tells you that you can or can't you choose which one to answer and johnny gets the other one well i'll i'll do the help right which is um <laughs> The, the help and the tail are entirely linked. I mean, in some respects, for, for us, because we were at the vanguard of this, and it, the, these were events of national in, interest, we were both dealing with UK government, but also the Scottish government, to make sure that one, they, they got comfortable with the concept of, of pilot events, and got comfortable, comfortable with the idea of the, the health and safety wrap that we were putting around them. But of course, we then need to engage really effectively with every other stakeholder at a local level, to make sure that the local city and the local, um, health and safety teams are, are comfortable with that. So having that sort of support from government, really important, but I imagine going forward, the real people that are gonna sign off events are the local authorities and those local practitioners. So getting engaged with them really early is, is, is vitally important. Um, we, we drew upon experience from across the UK and internationally in terms of demonstrating best practice. And I think that's what the local authorities and the government are gonna look for. They're gonna look for event organizers to see the plan that you've got is robust and it's been tested. And here's some examples of where it's been tested. So anything you can do to share best practice creates confidence in those uh, colleagues that have the ultimate authority to sign off your event plan. And who are those colleagues, Johnny? Who are the main stakeholders? And can somebody define, can you define SAG, just in case there's others on the call that, that don't know what a SAG is? Sure, so, um, well, firstly, from who we consulted, I mean, very similar experience to Dom, obviously. We, UK government, if you have any international aspect to your championship, is an absolute must because the borders are a reserved matter. So any permission for people not to come into the UK and not quarantine is absolutely a UK government reserved matter. We had to have those conversations with DCMS and they were extremely helpful and supportive. Uh, if you're doing an event in any of the devolved nations, you absolutely have to get the involve, involvement of the, in our case, the Scottish Government and the Public Health Scotland, who were extremely supportive as well. We had many calls with, uh, Don mentioned Jason Leach, the Clinical Director for Scotland, and many of his clinicians who were extremely helpful and supportive. Uh, Dr Andrew Murray, who's a well-known uh, medical officer in sport uh, and works for the, as the Chief Medical Officer for the European Tour, advised us very strongly and gave us lots of very insightful uh, advice and also acted as the Chief Medical Officer at the Championship. Health and safety is hugely important. I think your supply chain is extremely important as well. We had to make sure the supply chain could actually cope with what we were asking them to do, given the situation some of them find themselves in. And finally, the local authority, and as you say, SAG, this stands for Safety Advisory Group, and uh, that is a 
very important body that anyone who runs an event will know what a SAG is because you really can go ahead without them because that will be emergency planning, it will be your incident response plan, your emergency incident if an emergency is called, uh, it can have the security protocols, it, it looks after every aspect of uh, the risk mitigation at uh, any event and uh, they're an incredibly important part of the process. We've got a couple of questions coming through. Unsurprisingly, people are interested in the financial element of this, um, and there's, there's two halves of that. One is, um, did you get any support from the government or, or local um, support? And what do you? How sustainable is a model with either no or very reduced spectators? And how how can we start to build confidence um, in ultimately the people that we do this for? Is the people who come along and, and participate and, and join in? So. Johnny, do you want to give us your thoughts on, well, I guess the direct question, was there any financial support or is this all off um, the RNA's own back? Yeah, I mean, uh, no, we didn't get financial support, but we didn't ask for it. Um, I'm, I think I've been clear that um, it's in the public domain that the Open Championship had pandemic insurance and uh, as a governing body, we you know, we were prudent in making sure that we were insured against all force majeure events, including a pandemic. And that obviously allowed us to uh, make the decisions that we did. Uh, you know, we're very keen to make sure that we used that position appropriately. You know, we created a COVID fund of around seven million pounds, which was available to the golf industry where, um, there has been a lot of suffering uh, as Dom says we have lots of clubs not just in the UK but around the entire world that are struggling and uh, we wanted to make sure that we were supporting that process um, but we also were absolutely strategically aligned to the fact for the reasons I've outlined that we wanted a successful AIG Women's Open uh, for the reasons I've outlined and we were prepared uh, as part of that process to spend the money doing so. You know, just in terms of paying out the prize money in full, you can imagine uh, that made it a, an expensive proposition, but one we were wholeheartedly happy to do for the reasons I outlined. And Dom, I guess the question to you then is, you know, you've had some spectators, um, that doesn't, not very many, but it's a good start and you've obviously got plans to scale those up. At what point does that break even um, and do you see that being possible at all in a pandemic situation or um, are we, we stuck in partial participation for a while? Look, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, so we're, we're going to get there and we're going to get there quicker with smart people coming up with smart plans. Um, so we, we sort of grabbed this re relatively early and said, look, we can either hide under the blanket and um, mothball the, the business, or we can be sort of proactive, come up with some ideas and try and get some activity mm -hmm. restarted. And that's why we're pilot events sort of was born out of. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we had a route map as a result of starting small to growing thereafter. And that's, that's, that's vital for us as a sport, uh, but it's actually vital for the whole industry. And if the industry can sort of piggyback off some of the learnings from Johnny and from, from myself, that's, that's really helpful. Um, we need to get back to a point where we can get crowds back into venues, whether it's stadiums or whether it's indoor or outdoor venues, in a safe and secure way, but back in, the num back in numbers that make sense financially. So for us as an organisation, if I give you a little bit of an insight, we have sold out the last 17 Scotland games in a row. So that's 67,000 people coming through our turnstiles. So that's big revenue that we create. Um, but we can manage without full houses, of course we can, but the sport requires the investment from a governing body, whether it's golf or rugby or football, and that investment comes through spectators in the same way that a live music in event requires spectators to come through and have a great, great experience. So part of the messaging that we've said to government is, okay, these are the mitigations, these are the plans for a pilot event. They're completely impractical, completely impractical for scaling up of any size for any length of time, but we can do that for a short period of time, if that creates a route map for, for events to, to restart, um, because we all want to get back watching major events, we all want to get back watching um, music, um, and that's really important for us to show some sort of route map. So I think the government um, have heard that pretty clearly from the events advisory group that Johnny and I uh, are involved in, um, but they're grappling with an enormous challenge. So it's a beholden on us as events organizers to try and come up with some smart solutions. And I just wonder within that teething 
it's going to be uh, rolled out from Monday onwards. That offers some local opportunities for event organisers to begin to restart in, in their area in, a, in a, an appropriate way and in a way that doesn't undermine them financially. And I think you know this is a good enough place to say it. You know, we would love, I think, as an industry, that the government puts a fund in place to help restart the event industry. It's really clear about saying that we know that you're going to start under pressure. We know you're going to start start under restrictions. We want to help you out. So Johnny, uh, myself, and the whole of the events advisory group have been saying that to government the last number of weeks and months. And I think we should continue to say that because without the event industry thriving, there's a there's a you know there's a lot of culture that could be lost to this country. And I yeah. think it's also good that the event, the, the, the supply chain underneath that is really important as well. And uh, that needs government backing and support as well to make sure that when we are ready to restart, the whole infrastructure is in place to restart. Yeah, and Dom, you talked about it in your presentation, and there's a couple of questions about um that spectator engagement, that it's a conversation between you and your fans or your audiences or whatever your event um, genre calls, the people that show up and, and cheer along. Um, and I, I was really taken by this idea of a, a code of conduct between um, the club and its fans. Um, and I think that, that actually there's a huge amount of loyalty in that those spaces. Um, and if we get those customer behaviours right, that will help us scale up. Um, there's a question in here about did you capture feedback from those customers, uh, those spectators after that event about how they felt and what you might change? Yeah, we, we, we did. We, we wrote to everybody uh, who came to the game and did a quite a detailed survey with them and the response rate was ridiculously high and it was ridiculously positive about their experience. So, you know, if, if I distill it to, to one question, would you come back tomorrow to an event? Yes. And I think that's such a powerful message for us as, a, as events industry to remind government that there is a willingness within the public, even with the conditions that are, are out there just now and the restraints that we're putting on them in terms of coming to events, um, that they still want to come. You know, if I'd said to, to this, this group a, a year ago that I was going to be encouraging people to come to a major event wearing a face mask, um, you would have thought, you know, your audience would never be up for that. The audience is up for that. The audience is, is desperate to come back out and watch golf and rugby and football and music. And if the conditions are right and the interventions are, are appropriate, then I think the audience will, will respect that, given that we're in this very, very challenging climate. So I think we've got a lot of confidence in our audience and they've, they've certainly shown that. And Johnny, do you think Johnny, you'll, do you have think you'll have spectators? Oh, I can hear myself. Oh, I can hear myself. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, yes, I mean, oh gosh, I'm, gosh, I'm echoing as well. Echoing as well. I don't know if you two want to try. Do you want to try? Do you want to try? Oh. oh. If you go, yeah, that. that. If you go on mute, Lindsay, that might help. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. we, well, I'm going to have to try and deal with an echo. We are absolutely. We are wanting to get spectators back, and we have the Open Championship ne next year down in Kent, and we are certainly planning to have a business as usual event which would have around 210,000 spectators. Uh, we have an AIG Women's Open at Carnoustie next year uh, and a Senior Open at Sunningdale. And we hope and wish to have spectators at all of them and uh, obviously we have to be realistic though and we are working through scenarios which include a business as usual approach, which include a dampened down business as usual approach, a reduced scale event which may be you know, half the number of spectators and of course a behind closed doors uh, event. But as we both stressed, all of those scenarios have been worked through the side process and the various locations. The UK government is involved at every level uh, with what we're trying to do. And the Scottish government has obviously been engaged with regard to the Women's Open at Carnoustie. But just from a motivational point of view, from an optimistic point of view we are working towards this is going to be uh, golf and sport back at its best uh, come next summer and if there are still COVID implications we'll make sure we're ready to deal with them and uh, I keep trying to show learnings for everybody to learn from you know we've learned plenty from what Dom's gone through we've learned plenty from what other people in the event industry have done I'm learning all the time from colleagues in other industries in the event advisory group. 
uh, which I'm taking back to my team to keep learning. I do, I really do feel this as the event industry working together to get back what is culturally and mentally extremely important for this country and indeed the whole of the UK. Amen to that. Um, we have just a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask you both um, in a less than a minute each to give us a sort of parting words, a must do, a takeaway, a top tip, something. Um, I like the optimism, so we can keep it in the optimistic vein, because um, I do think as a collection of people in the events industry, we are optimistic and we do strive to, to make things happen. Um, so if you each want to give me uh, your sort of your parting wisdom, Dom. Oh, um, I, I guess I, I would just underline a couple of comments that we made previously, which is engagement, engagement, engagement. Make sure you engage with each other as best you can. Make sure you engage with the local authorities' side. I would also try and identify an appropriate medical person to give you some advice. So we're very fortunate in rugby that we've got access to really quality medics um, who were able to guide us in some of our planning. And I think that would serve people really well mm -hmm. in terms of the thinking and their planning. If you can get a, a local public health specialist to to give you some advice um so engagement really important collaboration vital you know as an industry we've been um probably more challenged than very than the most industries in this whole pandemic um but the way for us to restart will be through collaboration and i'm just wondering again if that tiering um in scotland will pr pr provide a bit of an opportunity for some events to restart and as soon as some of them restart even small scale ones we should be shading around the industry the learnings from that and and, 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 and we do not lose sight of the prize the prize the prize is like get the country back into it into it having fun having listening to music listening to music enjoying wonderful culture, 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 culture because nobody does it better than the events industry in scotland and with a bit of uh, direction over the next number of months we'll get that restarted again so I would definitely make sure we keep engaged, keep collaborating, and we'll get there. Motivational, Motivational even, in even in slightly robot, slightly robot mode. mode. Johnny, Johnny you're you're part you're... we've got through nearly an hour without any technical issues, and now it's decided it hates us. So, Johnny, your parting words for us. Yeah, I mean, they, they would be very similar to Dom. I think engagement, I absolutely 100% agree with Dom on that. You, it's not possible to put these on unless you bring everybody with you and I, you know that means public health it means medical expertise you must get medical expertise at the moment uh it needs government support at national at uk level and devolved level um collaboration not just with uh all of those bodies but collaboration with other sports as i pointed out i've learned a great deal from dom and his what he's done um and from lots of other event industry experts um Gay education we need to make sure if when you get people either spectators or closed behind closed doors events you need to make sure everybody coming along understands exactly what you're trying to do what the protocols are how they're going to operate and that they adhere to them and understand the consequences of not adhering to them you need to make sure that you have an ability to monitor and measure those protocols to make sure that you can react if they're not working the way you expected them to um, it's really important that the current if you are going to do it that you understand what you are prepared to do financially in terms of not just your own time and the time of everybody involved but what the financial implications are and i think the last message i would get is that the industry and everybody on this call the event industry is full of people that understand better than anyone how to run their own events and they understand better than anybody what mitigations will work and what will keep people safe and the great danger is that we all start focusing solely on uh, COVID and we forget there are security implications there are multitude of health and safety implications those risks have not gone away and our event industry and everyone on this call representing that understands that is the best place to operate it and we need to be allowed to go and do that and show to the government that we can put the mitigations in place to reduce social distancing and let's have an appetite to reduce that and get the industry back and get sport and all events back and people back to enjoying what they were enjoying nine months ago. Thank I'm you. looking forward to going back to Murrayfield, that's for sure. Maybe we could put a, a circus act in the middle of it. That just just a suggestion. Um, so thank you both. Uh, thank you to Dom and Johnny for their really detailed, really insightful 
thoughts today. Um, we didn't get through half of the questions that were coming in, um, but the good news is um, the activity of the event an industry advisory group is public. Event Scotland's website has all of the details on that. Um, there are more webinars um, coming up where we'll learn from different people from different parts of the sector. We will send the presentations. Um, so it's just for me to thank you both again for your participation. Uh, to thank Event Scotland for hosting this and particularly Kat who actually made it all happen. So thank you Kat. And uh, to those of you that we know and those of you that we don't know, um, good luck and um, let's all talk to one another and enjoy your weekend when it comes. And I don't know how to end the broadcast, so somebody has to do that for us. Have a good day, Thank everybody. You. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.